Holy heat. What the heck is growing on? Hey, for those that are maybe on here for the first time and wondering maybe what's growing on here, uh, this is where we get together each and every week to answer your garden questions, maybe to inspire you, to motivate you to get out there and garden. We have a community of gardeners that hop on here, ask questions, but at the same time, for those questions that I don't get to answer, they will chime in and answer in some of the comments. And that's as simple as it is. Just go into your comments, put a comment out there and or a question, and we'll do our best at trying to answer it or the community will get there and answer it for you. If you're wondering who the heck I am, maybe you're here for the first time. Everybody knows me as Frankie Flowers. I'm a four-time best-selling garden author. Uh, I think I'm a three or four-time recipient of Landscape Ontario's Garden Communicator of the Year. Uh, you can see me each and every morning on breakfast television uh, where I do the weather. I'm wild about weather, but also passionate about plants. You can also see me on City Line. I've been on the Dr. Oz show. I've been in many publications and my family own two garden centers, one in Bradford, one in Barrie, Ontario, called Bradford Greenhouse's Garden Gallery. Look at that. Just uh, getting a little bit of a thing there to tell me to breathe. Imagine that your phone actually tells you to breathe at times here. Um, it's really great to be here this morning. Uh, let's get growing. And I, I got to give a shout out to my friend, Tanya. And Tanya, we do have to organize to get you on here to talk about all your travels. Uh, she was recently in Nicaragua. She was at uh, some plant trials in California. So indeed, we got to do that. So let's schedule that for, let's talk this week. And I'm the one that's guilty. I'm the one that's guilty that when it comes to that, I got to do that. Uh, a big shout out to Marlene this morning. Good morning to you from Brantford. We also have a really good morning out there. Uh, to Connie. So it all depends on where, where you're watching us from this morning, because I know people from across the country watch us. But the one thing that everybody's been talking about is really the headlines that are happening right at this time. And here's a look at City News, where I work. Toronto breaks nearly a 50-year temperature record as summer like sizzle continues. This has been the story pretty much all week long, where we've been seeing consecutive days of really warm weather. However, Dun, dun, dun. What is going to happen this week? Well, let's show you a little look at the seven-day forecast for the City of Toronto for this week as we take a look at Environment Canada's forecast today. Another beauty of a day. 23 degrees. If you get a chance, put some fertilizer on the lawn today because tonight it's going to get wet. We're going to see wet weather push its way through with the risk of thunderstorms as a cold front moves through. And then, as you can see, the rest of the week, the temperature drops. We could see... Temperatures below minus one on Tuesday evening into Wednesday. And with that, that means frost. So what does that mean? Well, first thing is, if you are an ambitious, um, motivated, excited first-time gardener, and you went out there and you planted a bunch of different things that are soft and or tender, you're going to need to cover them up on that evening. If by chance, and we have had a lot of different plants that have flushed out, so say I've been seeing many magnolias in bloom. Some of those magnolias at a minus one, those blooms should be fine. But if we start to dip to about a minus five, it's going to knock off a lot of those blooms as well as it can knock off the blooms on forsythia, even for some of those fruit bearing trees that now are flushing out, it can actually do some damage. Anytime that we have a very extreme warm up from consistent days, it pushes and flushes out growth. You probably notice your, your uh, allergies have really started and my nose is starting to tickle as soon as I talk about allergies, is that your allergies have really increased. Uh, we've seen a lot of active growth that are out there. It's almost too late to put down uh, a, a pre-emergent, which is like some of the corn gluten products, like some of the weed and feeds and some of the weed preventers that you see that are out there because already we could have some germination of weed seeds out there in some of the lawns. It is still too early to put down lawn fertilizer because we have those temperatures. So this is a grave concern. You know, this warm up, as much as we are enjoying it, could impact our gardens. Now, a lot of people out there are going to ask me that if we get cold like that, should I be covering up my spring flowering bulbs, like my daffodils, my tulips, um, even some of the hyacinths and things like that? I would just leave them uh, because, as a matter of fact, the cooler temperatures is going to make them hold longer. So we could actually have a longer bloom period. If we continue to have this warmth consecutively for 14 to 15 days, they would go through their cycle and bloom rather quickly and then they would be out of there. Really what we want now is a nice gradual warm up and we do want temperatures to hover overnight lows just above that freezing mark would be ideal with daytime highs seasonal, which are seasonal highs for this time of year should be between 11 and 12 degrees. So it is indeed 
a concern. I've never seen this many consecutive days this early in the month of April. Um, and it has gotten people really excited about the garden season, which I am too, but just don't get too excited out there. Uh, we got a good morning this morning and I love this message as well. Good morning, Frankie from Athena. Serena's is still sleeping. We have bought pansies. We will keep them inside on the night of frost. Thanks for the tip. So pansies uh, and violas, uh, they are a cool crop. They're an early season cool crop. And on those evenings, it'd be best. If you see the temperature is going to dip below the freezing mark and you can bring them indoors or just throw them in the garage. That's all you need to do. Just throw them in the garage. They can take colder temperatures. What'll happen with those is if we get down to about a minus two, minus three, it'll actually knock off the blooms, but they will bounce back from that. Osteospermum is another beautiful annual flowering plant that can do that. And even some of the uh, vegetables uh, will take a cooler temperature, like some of the cauliflower, broccolis, uh, kale, you can do that, but I would recommend covering them on evenings like that. Uh, we have another uh, little comment that's here as well. I'm surprised I have arugula and spinach that I planted last August. It's alive and growing in Toronto. Doesn't surprise me at all. Those things are happening out there. Uh, we have another comment here from my good friend, Tanya. She's saying to Sonia, pansies can take the frost. I brought mine home two weeks ago and we had frost and they are fine. Yeah, pansies, violas, um, panolas is another pansy viola mix. Uh, they are totally, uh, some of the trailing varieties of pansies can all take those colder temperatures as well. But if you can, and you can just pop them in the garage, why not? Because they're going to actually be healthier, happier, but they don't need to come totally inside. Good morning. Please, any tips on, on controlling box elder bugs? I'm glad that you're asking this question because it's not only box elder bugs that we're seeing right now. We are also seeing, uh, where is that article? I'm going to do this right here. A lot of times these guys here, oh, some leaf tickets. Look at that from the Toronto Star. Let's hope the leaves do well out there. Uh, also what box elder bugs are getting confused with, and I showed this article last summer or last early fall, fire bugs are new to Toronto. And so this is also what a fire bug looks like. And you can also see these fire bugs. Uh, they're seasonal there. And if you want to go to the Toronto Star article, you'll find out a little bit more information that's on them. In terms of controlling them, some of the best ways to control them is just to shop back them up if they're in a certain area. They will, the box elder bug as well as the fire bug will eventually go elsewhere. Um, you can put some bug bug on in some of the areas for them, which may help them out. It's not going to be a total control, but it will control them uh, slightly as well. So those are some of the things that you can do. Um, but uh, really sometimes just if they're coming inside your home, just shop vac them and they'll be the best way to do it. Just shop vac them and discard them. You can put a little bit of insecticidal soap like a bug be gone, even in that bag after you shop vac them and then just discard and throw them out. Mm. Um, here's a question for Christine Clark. Is it safe to unwrap your young cedars? It is. Um, so the young cedars, what those guys, uh, the reason why we're wrapping them is we're wrapping them to protect them from cold wind and sunny days. So the key is because now we were pretty wet. Remember we had a really wet, wet period of time there, but then we've had these consecutive days of dry conditions and our gardens are actually quite dry. If by chance we don't get a good rain this evening in Southern Ontario or where you're watching us from, if the ground is dry, I would recommend for you to unwrap your cedars, but I would also recommend you for a nice deep soaking of those cedars, really key and important. Now that things are actively growing, we can also consider fertilizing, but I would probably hold off until the end of this month before I would fertilize my evergreens and or my flowering shrubs, because we don't really want to fertilize right now, get another really quick, uh, quick warm up of a couple of days. And then they further flush out because of the fertilizer plus the warmth reaction. And then we get cold again. We really want things to gradually warm up. We want them to gradually, that's why we need a spring. We need like an early spring, a spring, a late spring, an early summer, a summer with that gradual, nice warm up. We don't want that hockey stick where it just goes boom up, like that because it can cause those extreme variations of temperature are really hard on plants. Question, can you guide us through lawn care now that the weather is warm? Thank you so much. So Lori, I'm going to recommend for you. So we're going to go here. So a couple of articles that we have is number one, I have what should, if you go to my website, Frankie Flowers, and that's frankieflowers.com, 
You can see that there's a nice article there on what you should prune in spring. But as well, what we do also have an article on, and it's pretty an in-depth article on, you can just scroll down the website. You can see when to seed lawn and how. This is going to give you some really good information on the ideal time to overseed the lawn and some of the early spring things that you can do for your lawn. But let's say that your lawn is pretty good. Let's say that it's pretty thick and right now it's just looking a little bit uh, winterish is the best way to say it. Uh, first thing that I would do is take a look at that lawn and see if it's nice and firm underfoot that you can walk. So depending upon where you're watching us from, as long as the lawn has dried and it's firmed underfoot, you can start consider working on the lawn. Next step that you're going to do is to walk around the property and the lawn, pick up any sticks or twigs that have fallen off trees or broken branches, clean up any debris, any leaves that are matted or sitting on there. Second thing that you're gonna do is to look at the thatch of your lawn. The thatch of your lawn, you have the green blades, but then underneath you have an area which looks like gra dry grass. If that's under half an inch or around a half an inch, completely fine. But sometimes your lawn will benefit from you raking up the lawn and dethatching the lawn. If your lawn and you've been walking on it has a high traffic area and it feels very firm underfoot, I'm a fan of aeration. The aerating of the lawn will pull out some plugs, so you can do that this time as well. And then what you'll do is you'll fertilize your lawn. Um, you'll fertilize your lawn with something high in nitrogen. One of my favorite ones at this time of the year is Scott's, uh, of course, Scott's Turf Builder, but I'm going to show you the bag. It's Scott's Green Max. So I'm just going to pull up a picture of that bag for you so then you can see and it doesn't matter where you're going to go and purchase that from but i'm just going to show you what it looks like i just got to go over here i got to go share my screen i'm a one-man show so i'm doing this all on my own right now uh where are we here uh blah, blah, blah. there we go Boom. so this is what the bag looks like of the green max so you can see there's a whole bunch of different variations that are there uh, i can actually just click on the scots one here this is uh, deep greening in three days, but it has, it's actually the reason why it does a deep greening is it actually has iron and that iron is really beneficial. And today in Southern Ontario is a perfect time to get out there and fertilize your lawn because we're going to see some rain tonight. And that's the whole idea. We want to put the fertilizer down and then we want to rain. If you're overseeding top dressing your lawn to thicken it up, we got to make sure that soil temperatures on average will consistently be at about 15 degrees Celsius. You saw the seven day forecast, we're gonna get cooler. So it still hold off on seeding your lawn until the end of the month. If your lawn has grown already, no problem. You can get out there and cut your lawn at this time. If you do have crabgrass, there wouldn't be, you maybe could get away with putting down a weed preventer. That'll be um, uh, what is a pre-emergent, which will coat weed seeds and not allow them to germinate. If you do put that down, it's about six weeks before you can seed your lawn because it will coat any seeds that are out there. So there are some good tips for you as well. Uh, we got Matthew saying a good question out there as well this morning. I have a question for you. Can I come to your live show sometime and show off some of my autographs sometimes? Thank Matthew. So Matthew, what you have to do is you got to email the show, Breakfast Television, and what's called the show pitch. And then we can pitch that you have one of the most extensive collections of autographs. We can probably make that happen because you're also a big fan of Breakfast Television as well. Uh, good morning, Frank. I wanted to plant uh, Eastern Redbud, beautiful tree, uh, in my backyard to replace a tree I lost last year. It was windstorm. What is the best time to plant and the nursery with the best stock? So uh, it depends on where you are living, uh, M. Crawl. Uh, you can be planting right now because ground frost is out. Uh, Eastern Redbuds, of course, are a tree that they also want to make sure you're hardy in this zone. So they're hardy to a zone five. There are several nurseries that carry them. Will they have them in stock at this current time? Because many nurseries right now are receiving their stock. So we just called to your local nursery beforehand. Um, but most of the independent garden centers have really good selections of Eastern red buds. Some of the places out there like a Canadian Tire or a Home Depot may not be carrying those because, and often don't, because those are more um, kind of specialized and or specimen planting. Uh, but sometimes you can find them in good stock. So you just want to make sure it's a nice, healthy plant is the key that's out there. Um, Kathy Wood, good morning, Frankie from Hamilton Mountain. Good morning to Hamilton Mountain out there as well. Um, Michael, good morning to you. I heard you can apply iron to your lawn for a deeper green, but haven't been able to find the product. Any tip? Michael, I just showed you that uh, Scott's Green Max has iron. That's what's crazy. It's that deep greening. And that's exactly why I like the Green Max. It's also a slow release fertilizer. So when a reminder, when you're filling up your fawn spreader, 
You want to do that on your driveway and or your patio because sometimes people spill. And if you put too much in one location, you can burn the lawn, but it's a slow release. You just look at the bag. You actually adjust your broadcast spreader to the number that it says on the bag. You then go and put it across your lawn. Look at the pattern to do it. You make sure that you're covering your lawn fully because if you don't, you'll actually have a big green stripe in some areas and not green in others. But because it is a slow release, it won't burn your lawn and it is iron enforced. Once again, that's Scott's Turf Builder Green Max. Uh, we got a question and or comment here from Janice. The town of Georgina just planted a new tree on my lawn on Friday. What care and how much water should I be giving this new elm tree? Um, the care that you should be doing is watering is key. So it's a deep and frequent watering. So what you're doing is even if you were to put your hose out there on the tree and you just have it so that there's just a drip coming out of the hose, nice and slow, and you just leave it on there for an hour where it's just dripping, it's a nice slow soaking of that tree. And you would were to do that at least twice to three times per week. That's all you need to do. Once it flushes out its um, leaves, at that time you can consider fertilizing. You can use a fertilizer spike if you wish. But the other thing, because it has just been planted, this is the ideal time to use a quick start fertilizer. So it's a miracle Grow quick start or a transplant fertilizer if you find another brand. Um, but that is a fertilizer that will make that plant focus on its root system. And by its focusing on its root system will reduce the amount of transplant shock and it will do uh, much better, like much, much better overall. Look at that. I got some reflection that's happening off uh, the sun that's hitting off the bottom of my patio that's out there. Um, we got a thank you to Susan out there. Susan's always on here and Tanya and others helping me answer some questions. Uh, thanks, Tanya. This is the first time I tried them. I got them from a client's planter box last fall. I couldn't kill them as requested. LOL. Uh, Marlene. Uh, good morning to Marlene. When can I start harvesting my thyme plant? It survived the winter. When can I start harvesting my thyme plant? So anytime you can be, if you're, if it's surviving the winter and you have growth that's on there, you can prune it back now by at least a third. That means harvesting. That's going to allow it to flush more growth because we have longer daylight hours and it's doing well. If it's an exterior thyme plant that actually overwintered in the garden, because many times are hardy, then any of the brown that you see that's on there, you can just trim that brown off and clean it up and uh, make it for that. Uh, we got a good thank you this morning from Carolyn as well. Uh, we got a comment and or question right now from Heather. I'm crossing guard and last week I had a wasp land on my sign. It seemed very consumed. Uh, confused. I've never seen them out so early. So some of the pollinators, I actually saw a bumblebee. Uh, when did I see a bumblebee on Thursday? Uh, they are out there looking for flowers. They're out there looking for blooms because the temperature warmed up and they're like, hey, let's get out of dormancy. And when you saw that wasp last week, it could have been one of the first warm days. And if they're wasps that overwinter, when they finally warm up, they actually are a little bit dense and or dumb. But now they're looking for early sources of flowers uh, to sustain them and to pollinate and to also give them a food source. And so thankfully we do have some spring flowering um, bulbs that are blooming out there. And we do have some weed species at this time that are blooming as well. So they're out there in search of food. It's, uh, it's also shocking them and uh, making them not feel so good out there as well. We got a comment this morning uh, from my good friend, Madeline. Great info. Frank, I try my best. I try my best. Keeps me sharp too. All these questions keep me sharp. Uh, Pam, good morning, Frankie. I was wondering about hydrangeas planted last year. Uh, the tips have been bitten off by the deer and they've been touched by freezing rain. Is there any hope for the, these? Thanks, Pam. So Pam, if those are um, like, if they're limelights, if they're PG, if they're incredible, Annabella's, any of the ones that bloom on new wood. So if there are any variety of hydrangea that is not, that is not a macrophilia, they will be fine. Just cut them back where they're only about eight to six, eight, eight inches off the ground and they'll flush out. It's a little early, so you probably won't see any growth on them right now. They may come from the bottom right by the root zone, but they should be fine. Fingers crossed on those guys too. Um, question out there as well from Lilanda. Is it a good time to top coat the lawn with soil at this time of the year? Uh, what I would do is just fertilize your lawn right now. And then I would top dress your lawn a little bit later in this month and then overseed right away. Because if we were to top dress our lawn right now, and then we have the cooler temperatures that are coming, and then we get weed seeds that blow on that soil, and then we don't get on there ahead of those 
weed seeds and we don't put our lawn seeds down, the weed seeds germinate first. And then we have the lawn of Whedon instead of the lawn of Eden. So I would wait to top dress and I would top dress and reseed all on the same weekend. My good friend, Paula Polly, uh, good morning to you. I started petunias from seed. I have a dozen of seedlings. When I can plant these individual plants to pots, thank Frankie. Uh, so if those uh, little guys there have at least five leaves on them, if they're at a five leaf stage and their roots are rooted in the transplant cells, so they have a nice good root system, then you can transplant them to pots. No problem whatsoever. What about Creeping Charlie? Uh, Creeping Charlie is an invasive uh, broadleaf weed. Um, it is a perennial weed that is super hard to control. Uh, the reason why it's hard to control is with the cosmetic pesticide ban. Uh, we don't really have any uh, selective broadleaf weed killers that we can apply on lawn areas that can control weeds like the Creeping Charlie. So the options that we have is we need to remove, hand remove that Creeping Charlie, make our lawn the aggressor, the thicker, more aggressive plant on that piece of area. And then we need to continually to remove Creeping Charlie when we see it sprout to remove the top growth, the leaves, because uh, any plant needs leaves to sustain a root. So often if you have a patch of Creeping Charlie, what I generally recommend is to remove that patch put down some soil, edge it out, and then put sod over the top, which would work to smother. And then if you see any Creeping Charlie popping through the sod, then you're just hand removing that and removing that top growth. Always a reminder, cut your lawn a little bit taller if you have an issue with Creeping Charlie. If you're cutting your lawn at three inches, that'll shade some of the new Creeping Charlie underneath and not give it enough light to sustain it. Um, but Creeping Charlie, there's many articles that are out there on controlling Creeping Charlie organically, and that'll help you as well. We got a good morning and shout out from Belleville, the Ontario, uh, Ontario this morning. Dale, love Belleville. Really nice, nice uh, uh, for, for you. Uh, here we go. Not BT, you live on Sunday. Uh, Matthew Amos. Oh, maybe we could do it on a, we'll do a special edition maybe one time, Matthew, where we can show some stuff. What we could do is even, you could be at your home and we can do a live together. So we can do maybe a special edition. What can I plant? What can I plant is my large... Costco box, black, large Costco. What can I plant in my large? So Jessica, so before we even think about what we can plant, number one, that large black Costco box, uh, I don't know if it has drainage. So we want to make sure that it has drainage. So either uh, if it doesn't have any holes in the bottom of it, we need to drill holes in the bottom of it so water can flow out. Or what we want to do is in the base of that pot, we want to put something like rocks or even chunks of styrofoam that will be an area where water can sit and the soil can sit without. We want to use a container soil, like a miracle Grow container soil, or even a moisture control soil. So it has to be a soil formulated for containers. Then before we even figure out what you want to plant there, we need to know, is it sun, is it shade? And then also, what do you want? Do you want something with foliage? Do you want something with flower? So let's say that it's a sunny uh, area and we want to have something that's colorful. So often with a container, I like to put a thrill, which is some height, a fill, which is something that's going to fill the middle of that container and spill that will spill over. So what we could do is let's just do something super simple. So if it's for sun in the center, we could put a canna lily. So it'd grow up, give you nice leaves and some flower. Then around it for a filler is we could put a calliope geranium and the calliope geranium is even trail. Or we could even just do a dahlia. Let's say that we do a nice variety of dahlia that's in there as well. And then to trail over, we can use a wave petunia, super tunia, even some sort of calipricola. So that's an example of what you can do. So it gives you height, some filler, and some drama that down below. So we need those are the elements that we need to do because if we match the plants for the light and it's in the right soil with drainage, you're going to have a beautiful, successful container garden. That's the key that we need that's out there. Okay. Lorraine, good morning, Frank. Do you have any suggestions for perennials under maple trees facing north in Muskoka? So that's going to be dry shade because number one, it's underneath a maple tree. So that maple tree is taking the nutrients. It's taking the moisture. It's being a bully that's under there. Facing north, so morning sun underneath the tree. It's really, really probably a shaded area. Probably the best selection for you, but it would take some time to establish and you need to make sure that you edge around it quite well is Vinca Minor, which is Periwinkle. The Periwinkle would mat down and be a really nice ground cover for you. It will take some time for that to, to really fill that area. 
Other options, but may even take longer, is Pachysandra, which is a Japanese spurge. And then there's a Juga. The Jugas don't fill as nicely, but my, probably my go-to for that would be the, um, the Vinca Minor, which is the Periwinkle, and or just mulching that area because it will be one that's quite hard. And then you could actually plant in maybe some pockets of some hydrangeas that would pop up, but you would have to, once you plant in that area, you need to be up at the cottage to water I'm assuming that you're at the cottage in Muskoka because uh, you're going to need to give some water for it to establish. Once it's established, it'll be fine uh, and it can handle dry shade. But when it's first planted, it will need some additional moisture. Um, here's the question. Ronan, uh, red bud versus shadow blow service berry in Toronto preference. Totally different plants. Totally different plants. So the service berry is more of a multi-stem uh, bush that will get to about 12 feet in height. Service berry, the, the positives of the service berry is, is that they'll give you a white flower, a red berry, which will attract uh, some beautiful uh, birds in the wintertime and a beautiful red fall color. The red bud won't take as much space because it's the downfall of the service berry. It can get quite wide. Red bud won't take as much um, horizontal space. Uh, it will grow tall. It will give you the buds of it, uh, will come out and give you some nice color, more of a shade, uh, more of a specimen plant. Uh, out of the two, which is hardiest, the service berry is way hardier than the other. But if you don't have, if you have a tight property, service berry might not be the best selection for you. And there might even be a better selection for you that's out there. Any tips on getting rid of Japanese beetles that keep eating everything? So Japanese beetles, uh, are the larvae stage of grubs. So now is the time to control grubs in the lawn. So if you have anything digging up your lawn right now, you probably most likely have grubs. You can use grub be gone for that and or nematodes. For the Japanese beetle control, there's beetle be gone, which is a fairly new product last season or the season before. And as a reminder, uh, once you see them, you can be treating at that time. It's safe to use, Health Canada approved. The other thing that a lot of people will use is um, beetle traps, the June beetle traps. A warning about those traps, so those are pheromones, so uh, they will attract more beetles to the area. So if they're affecting a plant on your property, I really recommend for you to place them far away from those plants that are being affected, and it will trap those bugs and keep them. But really, my go-to there would be the uh, Beetle Be Gone. And if you want to see what Beetle Be Gone looks like, I will show you that right now. I will go right here, actually, and I'm going to go here. Just give me a second. Beetle Be Gone. And that is... Uh, if we go look here, boom, we're going to go images. Uh, and you're going to see this available um, at most independent garden centers. You can also see it available at uh, any of the other do-it supply centers as well. We'll give we'll give a little home hardware shown up here and show you their picture too. So I'm just going to pull that up for you guys right now so you can see what the product looks like. And once again, this is Health Canada approved. There's a look at the and it's Beetle Begone Max, and it's a beetle killer that will take care of that. But it's once again, you're not applying that until later in the season. That'll be in June that you'll be applying that product that's out there. Um, so we are sitting at around 28, so we got some time right now for a couple other questions that are out there as well. Uh, this is Marissa. Hi, Frank. Can I trim my wisteria now? What you can do is you can root prune. So take your, um, take your, your, um, spade a nice sharp spade go around the uh, just go about a foot away from that uh, wisteria maybe about 18 inches away just shove that down that'll actually help out some of the root system break out the root system uh, you can prune any dead wood on the wisteria that's there you can prune it back uh, just to make sure that it's fitting on your trellis so that's not weighing down your trellis and you'll be leaving it there after um, and then whenever you see any of the side shoots that start to come off uh, that's the growth of side shoots. Really restrict those side, side the side shoots, and that'll really help you for making sure that it blooms and does really well. Uh, we got another one for Cassandra. Trying to pick uh, a native to Ontario, yet also drug tolerant plants for planters and gardens this year. I daily perennials for gardens. Any suggestions? So you're not really giving me indication and or sun or shade. Uh, there are many native plants that are available that are out there. Let's say for shade. You have Joe Pie Weed. Uh, there is even um, uh, an, uh, a wild columbine that you can do. There's many different native uh, plant species. 
I'm going to give you a shout out and a resource today because the World Wildlife Federation actually has a fundraiser today. And that fundraiser is going up the CN Tower to raise funds for endangered species. But as well, what I want to let you know is they do have a very extensive um, list that you can see of native plant species. So just go on the World Wildlife Federation. It'll take you right to a nice list here. The other thing that I want to show you as well, is sometimes at plant cells, you can get many native plants. And I'm going to end on this as well. I want to show you guys a really great resource that's out there as well. And this is Garden Ontario. So if you're watching me, and many people do watch me from Ontario, you can go to gardenontario.org. And if you're looking for upcoming events, you can see right here that there is like, for instance, uh, there's the June General Meeting in La Salle, Ontario. We have the Woolrich Gardeners April Speaker Series that's happening in Elmira on April the 17th. We have um, uh, a nice controlling invasive plants, which would be, that's in Stouffville. That's at Lecton Hall on April the 17th. So there's lots of resources out there. And you'll also see if we go down and we go to some, there's the East Willenberry Gardeners as well. We can actually go to a little bit. We can subscribe to the calendar, but we can even go to next events that are there as well. And what we can do is we can see that there are some plant cells that come up more so in May. So check that out. That's gardenontario.org. Uh, so that's another resource that I found this week. So I'm going to leave you guys there because we are currently at 30 minutes. That's the whole thing. My promise is a half an hour to you, dedicated to you. If you have any questions, if you see some of the questions that are in the comments section right now and you have answers, please go up in there and chime and give your recommendations. I read through them and I learned as well. Um, don't get out there too early. Okay, don't be fooled by this weather. We got colder weather on the way. Once again, if you want some color, get some pansies, get some violas, get some osteosperm. You can even do Dusty Miller. They can all handle a little bit of cooler temperatures. But really, let's just kind of embrace, enjoy the weather, kind of get out there. Um, make sure your garden tools are sharpened, your lawnmowers are sharpened, your pruners are sharpened. Clean up the garage. Uh, get some of the tools that you gave away that you borrowed to the neighbors. And really just enjoy this little brief uh, amount of warm weather. We get wet tonight, so a good day to fertilize. Another reminder of that. And I just hope that everybody has a great Sunday overall. And uh, keep blooming. Stay healthy. Stay happy. I am off tomorrow from Breakfast Television. You'll see me back on BT on Tuesday morning.